I'd like to introduce now the Honorable Andre Iancu, who really needs no introduction, but I will give him one anyway. He's the Under Secretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property, and of course, Director of the USPTO. Um, it really is official bio. It says one of the largest IP offices, but let's be honest, it really is the premier IP office in the world. And under his leadership and leadership of former directors such as Dave Kapos, who's joining us at this conference as well, it really has maintained that leadership. And we are just thrilled uh, with Director Onkyu and the work that he's been doing. Uh, he's also in his role, as you may know, as advisor to the president through the Secretary of Commerce on domestic and inter international IP matters. And so in that scope, we're also hoping to get some comments from him today a little bit as we think about technology leadership in the 5G and inf Internet of uh, Things space. Many of you also know that before joining the PTO to take over the leadership of it, he was a managing partner at Irela Manella, one of the premier IP firms in the world. He also is near and dear to my heart a patent professor too at UCLA School of Law, where he's seen as an alumni as well. Uh, he's taught there for many years as an adjunct. And before his legal career, he was an engineer at Hughes Aircraft Company. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Director Iancu. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Sean, for that uh, very, very kind introduction. Uh, always a concern when the introduction is uh, longer than the actual uh, speech, uh, but uh, I very much appreciate that. Uh, and uh, I very much look forward to our discussion. I'll have some opening remarks, but um, the uh, most, most exciting part of the conversation of the event for me is uh, to hear your questions and hear questions from, uh, from, from the students and the audience in, in general. Um, uh, let me let me start though with a uh, big thank you to everyone associated with uh, CPIP uh, and and the Scalia Law School at uh, George Mason. Uh, you all do remarkable work training our next generation of legal practitioners. The students here are the ones who will represent the interests of those who own and use the most important asset of a modern society, and that is its intellectual property. In today's world. It's not even close uh, anymore as to uh, what drives and what will continue to drive our um, our economy and uh, and 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 uh, the overall state of uh, of human development. Um, so uh, let me um, uh, let, let me start by um, uh, by mentioning that. Uh, uh, my understanding is that uh, this event today is part of a much larger uh, a series of events that you guys are doing. And I know that um, our chief economist here from the PTO, Andy Tool, was with you just last week discussing the impacts of the Supreme Court Alice decision. Uh, and I'd be happy to address that as well uh, later on in, in today's program. Um, so we very much appreciate your abiding interests in, in, in our activities. Uh, as you well know, IP now controls the destiny of virtually every industry, uh, making legal protections more important than ever before. Uh, advanced digital technologies are transforming almost every product, every manufacturing process, and every logistical system needed to distribute them. Simply stated, protecting IP rights of innovators is the foundation of wealth creation for our country and the world today and into the future. It is a right that is written into the US Constitution, and it is a right that we at the USPTO most ardently protect. I am uh, very happy to discuss with you some of the most critical IP issues related uh, in general, but for uh, right now, related primarily to 5G, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and the digital economy. There is no doubt that the rollout of these technologies will fundamentally change our lives and well beyond traditional phone handsets and the like. These technologies will form the backbone of a new system of autonomous vehicles, smart cities, intelligent appliances, telerobotic surgeries, precision agriculture, and so much more. At this very moment, as I speak, we are experiencing the power of thousands of inventions and trillions of dollars of investment that enable us to connect in real time over these networks. The inventions that have been taking place for years and decades 
prior to this pandemic are enabling us to function and execute during this time of, uh, of, of, uh, of stress. So before I discuss some of the issues related to standard essential patents and the development of standards and the like uh, in these areas, I think it's important to put the current situation of patenting technology and industry into some perspective, international perspective that is, and historical. 20 years ago, the number of patent applications being filed by Chinese residents to patent offices around the world was close to zero. By 2018, that number had skyrocketed to almost 1.5 million and is almost three times the number of American residents obtaining patents at about 515,000 a year. Our chief economist, Andy Toole, calls the Chinese growth of patenting an explosion. It's hard to think of it in any other terms. As Chinese patent applications have increased at an annual average rate of 26% year over year over the past 20 years, patent applications by U.S. residents have been growing at about the same rate as U.S. GDP in the 2 to 3 or maybe even 4% range, but far from the 26% percent point, percent, uh, percentage um, for Chinese applications. And while some call into question the scope and quality of Chinese patents, and Chinese residents still lag U.S. Resident, residents in terms of overseas patent filings and licensing revenues, still, the sheer magnitude indicates that Chinese applicants are at the minimum attending to their intellectual property. Moreover, China has experienced exponential growth in patenting across emerging technologies from AI to IoT, robotics, biomedicine, and medical devices, new materials, and advanced agricultural and electrical equipment and devices. Technology is critical to the next technological revolution. In many of these technology categories, Americans receive one patent from the USPTO for every five to six patents issued to Chinese residents by the State Intellectual Property Office of China. In robotics, the ratio is 10 to 1. And in new materials, it is 13 Chinese patents to one American patent. Plus, China is currently putting the finishing touches on a strategy to influence the development of global standards in its favor. Its China Standard 2035 plan will be a blueprint for the country's involvement in setting global standards for emerging technologies, such as IoT, AI, and 5G. It is an extension of its Made in China 2025 plan. Our USPTO China experts say that China employs an extensive system of government incentives for IP, including subsidies for patents, tax incentives tied to patents, and other monetary and non-monetary awards as a means to get to, as a means to meet higher and higher government goals and metrics. If successful in areas such as 5G, Western companies may end up paying billions of dollars of royalties to the Chinese. But while China has become more involved in key standards bodies, such as the third generation partnership project, its success is not guaranteed. And with focused attention, we can ensure that it is US technology that sets the pace and generates the revenue needed for us to prosper as a country. Now, let me talk specifically about the adoption of standards in the area of 5G so we can prepare for a smooth transition to this advanced digital economy. It would be senseless if all of us had to carry around multiple cell phones to connect to incompatible networks. That's obvious. Standards development organizations have enabled interoperability by publishing common technical guidelines that ensure compatibility across any given technology. However, without predictable and reliable patent rights, standards would be stunted by having to use technology that was in the public domain, for example. There would be little incentive to innovate, little incentive to, uh, to, to uh, grow the uh, participation in standard setting organizations, and as a result, little innovation. 
it is primarily the private sector's inventions that become standard essential patents or SCPs uh, uh, in the United States. By the way, the key letter, as far as I'm concerned, in the SCP acronym is P for patents. So as I say, a standard essential patent is a patent too. Without them, the innovation system does not function and standards cannot be meaningfully set. Innovators agree to license their patents. They become essential to the standard on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms, also known as FRAND. Aside from this contractual nuance, although, by the way, it is an important nuance, but aside from that, SCPs operate no differently than non-standard essential patents. 5G is poised to radically expand applications to industries well beyond telecom handsets. Existing companies that produce products not yet connected to the Internet of Things will soon have to become familiar with FRAND licensing. New companies that design innovative products that generate and share that data will also have to become acquainted with FRAND. Among other things, this radical expansion of these technologies in everyday products will create a bonanza for lawyers and provide job security for many of your graduates for many years to come. I'm sure they're smiling now. Nevertheless, the traditional SCP licensing transactions between handset manufacturers and patent owners will necessarily, bro necessarily broaden the new classes of licensees in the 5G era. New players in the private sector, unfamiliar with previous negotiations to utilize standard essential patents, may, de may demand reforms to the traditional SCP licensing model that was historically based on transactions between handset manufacturers and patent owners. They won't want royalty payments to exceed their profits. In the case of 5G, it raises a fundamental question. What is the role of the US government in the transition to a ubiquitous 5G industrial complex? The federal government is not in a position to, revolve, to resolve 5G licensing disputes among private par parties. However, it is our role to ensure balance between patent owners and potential licensees so that patented innovations can continue to contribute to standard development development organizations. And to the extent there are disputes, they can be privately resolved or by the courts. The USPTO, the Department of Justice Antitrust Division, and NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, weighed in on all these issues last December and made precisely this point. If you haven't already, I recommend that you read the policy paper issued by the three agencies. It's on our website and it's titled Policy Statement on Remedies for Standard Essential Patents Subject to Voluntary Friend Commitments. It notes that the patent owner's friend commitment is, rel is a relevant factor in determining appropriate remedies, but need not act as a bar to any particular remedy. Moreover, while patent law would govern available remedies in SCP-related cases, the statement pointed out that it is the responsibility of the parties to do their part to keep the system running smoothly. The joint statement also noted that, uh, and I quote, the steps that encourage good faith licensing negotiations between standard essential patent owners and those who need to implement technology subject to FRAND commitments by the parties will promote technology innovation, further consumer choice, and enable industry competitiveness. The document was crafted to encourage the growth of standard-based industries unencumbered by the heavy hand of government. But the statement alone cannot further these aims. Market-based solutions reinforced by court proceedings must drive the process. Some of you may be aware that in October 2019, the Department of Justice and the USPTO filed an amicus brief in the Court of Appeals for the, Fir for the Fifth Circuit. Uh, uh, the case was HTC v. Erickson. Our brief argued that relying on past licenses or apportionment, along with traditional patent theories, might be useful in determining SCP valuations. This would be especially helpful when the IP licensing obligations of a standards body is intentionally vague. The U.S. government will continue to advocate for market-based solutions to SCP issues. Additional efficiencies in 5G licensing can come from the voluntary consensus standard bodies themselves, 
assessing new ways of facilitating the SCP licensing process. The SDOs set terms that are applicable to patent licensors through their friend commitments. Any steps that the SDOs would take to further clarify the terms of friend licensing would be a step towards facilitating good faith negotiations and the transparent exchange of information. Identifying a forum to resolve disputes in SDO IP policy would be another way to bring clarity to future licensing. Since patent rights are territorial, specific challenges to a patent must be brought in any relevant issuing jurisdiction. But the forum that is identified by an SDO for resolving contractual friend licensing disputes would insulate against adverse effects of international comedy. It would also prevent competing resolutions on contract law based issues. Others, by the way, have also recommended that companies carefully consider a patent pool for 5G SCPs. Patent pools can increase efficiency in licensing to, by lowering transaction costs for both licensors and licensees. But we know from experience how important it is to also pay attention to the details of such agreements. There are a number of important questions that have to be answered, such as how can licensors ensure that all the essential patents are joined? Who will make this, this assessment? How will the royalties be shared among pool members? Who will administer the pool? And importantly, are there any anti-competitive aspects of the pool? To the extent that 5G patent pools could serve as a market-based solution that streamlines licensing, we would welcome such a development. I do not mean to oversimplify the complexity of such an endeavor because it would likely be a sizable pool. There is a growing volume of patents declared essential to the practice of 5G while, at the same time, the standard is still under development. One frequently referenced 5G patent report by IP Lytix found that there are already over 20,000 patent families declared to be essential to 5G. That's families, not just patents. But simply counting patent declarations to a standard body does not take into consideration that many standards bodies do not seek information on issued patents that are essential to a specific standard. Instead, the standards bodies ask participants to declare their patents and patent applications that eventually may become essential to a standard that is under development. Many of these patent declarations are not essential to the practice of the standard, and they lead to inflated numbers. That is why it's imperative that we let the parties involved in the licensing of 5G technologies evaluate the terms of a license. It is, all, it is only the parties in negotiations who can fully appreciate the strength of a given SCP portfolio. They can also determine the value of cross licenses and whether the SCPs being licensed are actually essential. To date, this market-based system has achieved a workable balance and I look forward to the system carrying us through the next generation of technology. It is far better than government intervention through development and imposition of special SCP legal rules that would disrupt a more efficient market-driven licensing system. The USPTO will be, a step, will be steadfast in our efforts to ensure that the rules governing this ecosystem are clear, that all parties act, act in good faith, that it, we have a balanced system, and that licensing remains driven by industry. It is our constitutional duty to protect the interests of those whose patents enable them to take the financial and personal risks necessary to commercialize their technologies. All of us benefit from our nation's commitment to the protection of intellectual property. The US patent system is vital to the success of our nation. So I'll leave you with that. And I want to thank you, Sean, for everything you do and for everything the school does and for all of your contributions to the prosperity of the United States and the dedication to those who are inventing our future. Thank you, Director Yonko. And of course, if we were in real space, we'd have tremendous applause right now. Uh, really thank you for those introductory remarks. I uh, really covered a lot of great ground, including anticipating some of the questions I was going to get at with you. But I want to just pull out right at first that I just couldn't be uh, more pleased about the comments of what I'll call sort of pro-market, pro-licensing, you know, allowing the market to do its job and figuring out how to value these patents, how to create CPEs, the pools, 
um, and do these licensing transactions. It really is, I'm a big believer in how that works as a former transactional IP attorney. Uh, and so I really think that it's just incredible. Um, CPIP will also be doing some more work in this space, looking at those licensing transactions and trying to find a way to put out some, some more data and information on that. So everyone sort of stay tuned for that. Now we're gonna move into the mode of we're calling it fireside chat. And I'm realizing we have a missed opportunity. In virtual space, Director Yonku, I should have had the staff pull up one of those uh, virtual Yule log kind of videos that happen around Christmas time. We could have had a nice fire blazing in the background <laughs> virtually behind us, uh, but we don't. But, but perhaps the next time we meet in real space, we'll figure out how to get a, a fireplace so it's a true fireside chat. Um, what I want to ask you is to extend out beyond your remarks. First, I want to take us down to a fairly straightforward and basic level, because not everyone on um, this event as participants will have the depth of knowledge uh, that you certainly do, and um, even the depth of knowledge to understand exactly what's going on with 5G and in the patent space. So let me just ask this very basic question, and it really has in some ways two components to it. Uh, and the overall question is, what do we really mean? And what is the PTO? Uh, how do you classify 5G uh, as well as Internet of Things patents? And I mean this, um, the, the technical answer I know about things that are actually patents directed to the technology itself. So the kind of chip technologies, hardware routers, those kinds of things. But then I also mean, um, are you tracking and classifying things that will be broader, that will be directed inventions to the 5G space, but not just the 5G technology itself? Yeah, it's a very good question. It also happens to be an extraordinarily complex question, and it, uh, we don't have time. I'm sorry, I put you on the spot. But... No, no, it's quite all right. It, it, we don't have the time to go into the very arcane and very complex classification system for uh, in the patent world. Um, and we do participate in the international classification system um, called CPC. Um, uh, uh, but, but, but at a very high level, we don't classify by broad, high areas of standards type things. So 5G is a standard. We don't have a class for like 5G and another class for like 4G. Um, you know, these, these are very complex areas of technology that involve many, many things in them. So let me, uh, and, and then we, we basically classify by those things that are in them. Uh, so, so let me just back up a little bit. Uh, so, so what really exactly is 5G? It's a standard, of course. Um, uh, it, it's, it's the next generation of wireless infrastructure, by the way. Uh, these companies, the, 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 the world and the standards world is now working on 6G. Uh, you, you know, 5G is to, it's, it's already baked to a significant extent, obviously lots of work, but it's not fully deployed. Nevertheless, the engineers are way ahead of all of us, obviously. Um, but let me, let, me, let me step back and you may recall from movies at least for, not, not, not for me, Sean, but, but for your students. And I don't know about you, but at least for the, from movies that students can watch, not from personal experience, uh, those brick phones of the 80s that served as the first generation of mobile te telecommunications, uh, those, brick phone er that, that, those brick phones focused on voice calls exclusively. So that's often referred as the first generation, although obviously it wasn't referred as 1G back then. Uh, but then came 2G which was still focused on voice calls, but made the switch to digital standards and enabled text messaging. And as we entered the new millennium, uh, we started to get spoiled in the round 2000. 3G innovation brought us limited internet, and I remember how huge 3G was. Um, it bought, you know, we had internet on our phones, uh, allowing us to receive multimedia content uh, on the phones and, and, and the like. Uh, fourth generation started to hit the market in about 2010 and really amplified the prior 3G advances. It enabled mobile broadband, uh, which in turn spurred on uh, a lot of innovation for mobile applications. So, and, and most of us are still on that standard now. Uh, in 2020, though, we're starting to see the rollout of 5G, which is on the one hand, just another iteration in the wireless development cycle. But on the other hand, more importantly, frankly, 
this next generation of wireless will be absolutely critical in the in its technical capability as it will support a vast range of new applications new types of applications too according to the white house office of science and technology policy known as ostp america's telecommunications operators such as verizon at&t and the like plan to invest 275 billion dollars to deploy 5g networks creating 3 million new jobs and adding 500 billion dollars to our economy 5G promises gigabyte download speeds, a vastly increased ability to sustain network connections, and incredibly low latencies, orders of magnitude. The lag, you know, the latencies is the lag time you sense between hitting enter and waiting for a result. This might not make a big difference in you and I texting, Sean, but if you think about machine operations, artificial intelligence operations, co remote commands, uh, re operating remote machinery, operating remote armies, operating, uh, having surgeons operate remotely, manufacturing remotely, the latency, the, re the minimization of latency, and the absolute download, increase, the huge increase in download speeds changes everything the way, uh, uh, the way we operate. All of these internal technology areas, when it comes to the PTO, has its own classification system. Um, I can get even more technical within those, but you know, within the classification systems, we talk. We can talk about spectrum, virtualization, MIMO technologies, and many other things. So I'll stop there. I could say a lot more, but fantastic. No, thanks. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll just be open. I'm definitely old enough. I didn't have to watch the movie about the break phone. I lived through the brick phone era. In fact, when I was after college, long before law school, I was a sales rep, and the regional manager showed up one day. This is in the mid '80s. With you know, it's all way to have to get on the phone. I'm like, we're in the car, and he opens the glove box, and sure enough, out comes the brick. I was just amazed. Like that's the coolest thing ever. Uh, of course, now it looks ridiculous, but you know, it was kind of cool at the time. And then did you also did you also have the pagers? Remember the pages? Where you... Oh, absolutely. You know, that was the high tech of the time. Oh, yeah. Put that pager on your belt. You know, yeah. you're a badass if you got uh, pages coming in. Oh, wait, I'm using bad language here. So I don't want to get too casual. Uh, so pages were great. Break phones were great. And in fact, you know, there was a surge recently where it was trendy to try to bring back something that looked like the brick phone, but have it actually have real, you know, modern technology inside of it. That, that didn't last very long, but it was at least in the market for a while. Um, now let's move on to a related question. So a follow-on question to this, and we're going to come to the Alice question in a moment, kind of one-on-one question. But in between that and your last comments, um, one of the potential concern is just as we saw in the original dot-com boom, and then in blockchain, where you see people saying, "Hey, there's this cool new technology platform, you know, a major new foundational platform uh, like the internet itself." Then, gee, as I start porting things that existed in real space, like we sell pet food in real space, and then there's this thing called the internet in the 90s. Hey, what if I sell pet food on the web? And then I want to get a patent for that. So that's kind of what I was starting to get to in the first question. I really want to focus on in this question. Um, how will the PTO approach that in light of thinking that, you know, is it really um, a use? Is it an innovation in the technology itself? Or is it simply taking existing things and then putting them into 5G and saying it's an invention just because we're using 5G speed um, and low latency to be able to uh, proliferate this new technology? Uh, look, I, uh, at the high level, I see this in two different uh, buckets. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> uh, you know, there is the technology itself. Uh, as I mentioned in the prior question, it's the technology itself the, uh, that enables the 5G networks, and just as some examples, we, back to our classification system, we've seen a lot of new technology and 5G related technology and something that's called management of wireless traffic um, uh, or uh, multiple use of transmission paths uh, or radio transmission, significant increase in that uh, class. class. Uh, information error detection and prevention, uh, chip development, uh, and, and 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 the like, many other such areas. So there is a significant increase in that 
a lot of it, Sean, has already happened, uh, but obviously it's going to continue to happen. Second, there is going to be a lot of innovation of new things that are being enabled by the dramatic increase in speeds and dramatic decrease in latency. Um, things that we obviously cannot predict today, um, but also things that I've already mentioned that are predictable, and we are already seeing a lot of those uh, innovations. So, um, uh, I don't, uh, and then there's, of course, the third bucket that you alluded to, uh, which is, you know, you're doing kind of like the same thing as before, but you're doing it on a faster network, um, you know, and, and whether that's patentable or not, it depends on where, you know, you have to do your obviousness analysis and, you know, we can start talking about case law and all that stuff. But, you know, just if you're doing the exact same thing on a faster network, you have to go through the gram factors and see if it's if it's uh, if it's non obvious. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Um, uh, but that's a third bucket. I suspect that the most exciting innovation here, other than the technology itself, most exciting innovation is are the new things that will be enabled uh, by, uh, by, by the 5G uh, standards. As far as the PTO itself is concerned, I, I am not concerned that we'll be able to handle all of this. Keep in mind, we receive regularly about 600 and 650,000 patent applications a year. So there is an increase in this particular area. You know, uh, that's the way things go. We traditionally grow, see growth, you know, uh, at the same general level as the GD growth in GDP. Um, but we have, we've always grown since the founding of the country. Uh, you know, since George Washington signed that very first patent, which, by the way, was examined by Thomas Jefferson um, as the first patent examiner in, in the United States. Every year we've, uh, by and large, I mean, the, the trend has always been uh, up. So this, I'm sure, will be no exception. I think that's true. And so I, I like the way you classified that in the three buckets or categories, the core technology itself. And the third one being the kind of, hey, we're just, because stuff goes faster in 5G. But then it's that second category that I think is in some ways the most exciting. Because as you said, it's not that 5G is not exciting, but it does already exist. It's already here. And so the really exciting thing is as it gets um, rolled out now, industries that we haven't even thought of are completely new ways of doing things enabled by that 5G platform. So it really is taking advantage of the technology in a, in a different kind of way. So I think that is. Sean, let me emphasize on that point, the um, critical importance of this to national security. So if when you combine the dramatic technological improvements that, and it's not incremental, it's a fundamental dramatic step here that 5G enables uh, in the speed and latency and all that, that I mentioned. You combine that with other things that are happening right now, such as artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, autonomous driving vehicles and, and robotics and the like. Combine all that, you can understand why major countries are racing uh, towards maintaining or developing a technological edge here. Because you can see um, uh, gaps developing very quickly when you combine the power of, of these technologies. It, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for the United States to keep innovating at faster and faster rates. You know, there's some people that are saying, well, gee, we're growing, we've been growing two, three, four percent a year. You're getting more patent applications at the USPTO than you've ever gotten before every year is more than the year before. Isn't that enough? My answer is no, no, it's not enough. Whatever we're doing, we need to do much, much more. Why? Because we're not alone. We're not competing against the United States in 2020 is not competing against the United States in 2019 or against the United States in 2018. We're competing against other countries in 2020. And, we're comp and, and nowadays, unlike prior centuries, everyone is on the innovation bandwagon, from the biggest to the smallest countries. 
and they focus, they, they figured it out now. They might have been left behind in the past technological revolutions. They have made the decision now not to be left out of this one, and not just that. They've decided, many of them, that they want to be the leaders of this one. They see the potential. So um, all these issues are critically important. So we're discussing IP law here on this, on this, at this event and the like. But IP is just a tool. The, it's a very important tool, probably the most important dispositive tool for innovation. But nevertheless, it's just a tool. The ultimate goal here is to innovate and to maintain our technological edge. Yes, I couldn't agree more. In fact, that was going to be one of the last questions for you, but I think really between your introductory comments and what you said just now, we really are addressing that. And that's part of the reason why this conference is one of the themes is technology leadership. Uh, and I would uh, uh, second what you were saying about, you know, patents going all the way back to the founding of the country and really the IP clause and a lot of the first, uh, both the first patent act and even the first copyright act focused on maps, books and charts were really primarily about how does the federal government incentivize the development of economic leadership and then really even um, other kinds of military and other kinds of leadership as well. So basically, how do we make sure that we have the leading technology? And then on the copyright side, how do we have the leading sort of publications and information out there so that people can get access to information? So I couldn't agree more strongly about that. Um, I'll also note that when you mentioned before that we're already moving towards 6G, um, I was somewhat chagrined to notice that someone else already beat us to the punch and I saw an announcement recently for a 6G conference. <laughs> so, so now I'm feeling very behind the curve that we're only just doing our 5G conference. Well, no, no, Sean, we've discussed 6G here. You can say that this is your 6G conference. <laughs> there we go. Everyone take note of that. We'll make sure we get on our Twitter feed too, that we were in the 6G space already as well. <clears throat> okay, so let me move to um, one more question I have for you. And then I really, there's already a good queue of questions coming in from the audience and we want to um, get to as many of those as we can. Um, Related somewhat to the idea of the third bucket, things where it's just kind of, okay, we can do it faster and better uh, in 5G, but it's not really creating a whole new sort of industry because of what 5G does. Um, and then tying it together with 101 issues that continue to, to vex us through the courts. And then you mentioned the Alice case before. So can you give us an update on what the PTO is currently doing on 101 guidance, 101 issues, and particularly in this space of we're still vexed with, you know, well, software and code is just an abstract idea and not therefore patentable. Um, and, you know, we can distinguish things that really are in advance of the technology versus things that really are just, hey, I'm going to put this in code. And so that makes it patentable. If you could address that, we'd appreciate it. Sure. Uh, and just to understand the audience, Sean, folks know when you, when you say 101, people know what we're talking about, or should I step back a little? Give a quick comment on that. I think we're getting ahead of uh, some of our participants, perhaps. Thank you. Okay. So, Section 101 of the Patent Code is uh, about patentable subject matter. In other words, what is it that humans do that is subject, that is available for patenting? So, for example, things that are not patentable are artistic creation, the creations, the fine arts. You paint something, uh, or you choreograph a dance, um, or you create a song. Those are not subject. It's not patentable subject matter. It's outside Section 101. Uh, Section 101 is a threshold inquiry, and basically, it translates the constitutional mandate to issue patents on the useful arts. So 101 basically interprets what are the useful arts. And 101 tells us, uh, it's 35 USC 101, tells us that the useful arts really are, are processes, uh, products, manufacturers, uh, and compositions of man. By the way, the words of section 101 were written in 1790 or 1793 by Jefferson and Madison, and it is identical to what we have today, except for the word process was added later instead of the word art. Um, but courts have interpreted them, them the same. So um, uh, the, uh, we, we have a statute that is literally as old as our country, and those guys were brilliant. There's no question about it. They were really smart. But as smart as they were, 
I still don't think they predicted 5G technology or artificial intelligence or autonomous vehicles. And I don't think that they necessarily um, had those things in mind when they wrote the patent code at that time. And this area of patent law has not, the code has not been changed since then by Congress. But because technology has changed and so many other things, because they didn't change it, it was the courts stepped in. So the courts issued a number of decisions, the Supreme Court. And unfortunately, the decisions from the courts have left this area of law in, in a state of some confusion. Um, the result is most troubling for the technologies of the futures of the future, precisely what we're discussing now, which are very much dependent on software, on mathematical calculations, um, uh, and electronic processing, things that you cannot touch and things that you cannot see very well or at all. Things that you have to think about. Cryptographic keys, you can't really touch a cryptographic key. You cannot really touch. I mean, I kind of see you now, but I can't touch you. So there are things in my mind's eye created by this technology. And some, and, and some courts have said, well, I, I, I don't know if it's technology. I don't know if it's the useful arts. I don't know if it's a process machine manufacturer composition of matter, which is in the statute. And they created these exceptions. Um, and the result is confusion in these areas. And it's very problematic because the bottom line is it is technology and it has to be patent eligible. Uh, and we have to have a clear test as to what is eligible and what isn't. And if it's pure math, for example, you're just doing math for the sake of doing math. Without a practical application, maybe that shouldn't be eligible. But if you're doing math for a practical application like a cryptographic key or compression technologies or the like, well, then that should be eligible. And uh, but the courts have left this line very blurred. So what we've done at the PTO is to take all the case law, synthesize it, and create what we think is a very or a much more clear test now, given the circumstances handed to us. And it's been out for a year and a half, actually more than that now. It's working really well here, we think. Um, Andy Toole, the chief economist who spoke to you guys last week, uh, he did a statistical study. It shows that uh, the uncertainty of examination surrounding Section 101 has gone down by 44% to pre-Alice, to, to, to pre-court case decisions that have confused the, the this area. Uh, so it's working really well. The problem is that we're just one branch of government. We issue these patents, but then the patents will be challenged in court. What will the courts do? What, stat, what, what's, what tests do they apply? It doesn't seem like they're making any changes to their approach. Uh, the same state of relative confusion continues there. Um, they're independent, so they obviously can and should do whatever they think is appropriate. Um, but they could. They could fix it. They could, they could look at what we've done. It, it actually works. They could do the same thing or something similar or something else, but it's fixable. And if they did that, let me simplify. If they simply say, we agree with what the PTO did, we would be done with this issue. We could stop talking about it on every single conference that we have. Um, uh, and we could move on. And, uh, but we're not there yet. And I do want to emphasize that as we enter this new era of technological development, we must fix this issue in the United States. Again, to my prior answer, it's a question of national security. We must innovate and incentivize innovation in this country, in these areas, at the highest possible rates. And if we have an area of confusion, it stifles the investment that is needed to make of both effort and resources uh, to develop these areas of technology in the United States. And then we'll be 
waking up 20 years from now or 10 years from now or whatever it is um, and say, hmm, we're at the disadvantage now, what has happened? Uh, and that is something that I'm very keen on working to avoid. Thank you, that's incredibly helpful. And I really like your example of math. Uh, I've done some writing in this area myself on this demarcation line uh, with um, what is patentable. And then you think about copyright and going back to that constitutional IP clause, founding fathers knew what they were talking about. Science was all the journal articles, books we talk about. So it's like the ways you study how to do math, like in school. So how, do I, how do I think about geometry as a system, calculus as a system? And that's the science of it. And then the art was really, forget fine arts, it really was art being used at that time, as you know, why we started using process instead, was art and artifice, artificial artifact. It was the ways that we did things, exactly, it's the practical application. And so that line really shouldn't be that hard. And unfortunately, the courts have muddied it up uh, tremendously so. So I really appreciate your, your comments on that. So let's get into some audience questions now in the time we have remaining. And I'll note that Director Yonke was, was concerned that his remarks we wouldn't have enough uh, material to fill the hour, and I was quite sure we would. Uh, so first question is from Keith Grizel, a friend of CPIP. Uh, he said, asks, what happens if a startup creates some new technology that leapfrogs over 5G? How would that company see a financial return, and could they operate given the power of current 5G standards groups? Well, um... I don't know that um, uh, that I am the person to answer that question. Frankly, it really is, in my view, market driven and should be left to the markets to decide. We see often in the in, in the IP system that sometimes phenomenal inventions are ahead of their time, ahead of the market. And if the, the patent is for a limited time, uh, independent of market entry and market performance. The patent lasts nowadays 20 years from the time you file here in the PTO. If the market's caught up with you or not, that's a separate, completely separate issue. And sometimes it so happens that you're, fi you're just too brilliant for the rest of the world and you have filed something uh, that is too early. And by the time it catches up, your patent might have uh, expired or get close, uh, uh, close to expire. Uh, but nevertheless, I think key, the key is licensing transactions, um, engaging, having IP is obviously important. Without that, I don't know, I mean, it, it, it's very difficult. But once you have IP, engage with the companies uh, that uh, are active in this area and see if they can uh, they can use your technology. Great. Uh, I, I, I just one oh, sure. final part that's not directly on point, but it, I think, is important. Our constitutional IP system precisely does not re require ma manufacturing. This was a big change. You didn't have to be rich. You didn't have to be friends with the crown, and you didn't have to make things. In before us. Before our system, the other countries, the, you know, the, 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 uh, Britain, for example, they required you to make things in order to have a patent, among many other things. Well, it's a rich game, a rich man's game, making things. Um, so this is a very good example. The question calls to mind. You know, it, it, you know, it, you can try to work with folks who actually are at the leading edge. Um, of manufacturing and might they might be able to use your IP. Yeah, completely agree. The um, licensing and franchising model, as was mentioned in the first panel, goes very far back um, with my sort of IP history geekery. I can also say that um, licensing is expressly authorized in the first patent act in Venice in 1474. So, but then you're absolutely correct that then um, from that time on, a lot of the European countries including Italy, then start changing it to have these working requirements where you have to practice it. But that licensing and franchising model has really been so powerful for the U.S., whether people sort of love it or hate it, but it really is the model behind uh, uh, consumer products, even things like Starbucks and McDonald's and things like that. So the way of then uh, taking all kinds of IP and inventions and then having other people contribute their capital so you can actually get it out there in a more collective way. 
because otherwise, as you're saying, exactly one person can't do that all themselves for the most case. You would stymie so much great innovation. Next question is from Aman Sinha. Do large damage awards like the recent Cisco decision damage the industry or ensure proper return for investment in intellectual property? Well, I can't comment on this on any specific case, including that one. Um, uh, but uh, let me say this. Um, the what's important is for the law to be followed and for the damages awards uh, to be commensurate with the actual harm suffered by the patent owner. Um, so I cannot answer the question as to whether a particular award uh, is too large or too little without knowing the facts of that case. It could very well be that the harm was much higher. I mean, some of these products are put into billions, some of these, you know, chips or whatever are put into the into billions of devices um, and have humongous commercial value. Others quite the opposite and have very little, if any, commercial value. But our system of uh, laws, including on the on the damages side, is meant to be flexible and give uh, the decision maker, whether it's a judge or a jury, the tool to weigh all those things in a particular case, given the facts and circumstances, and come to the right uh, right award. I want to be careful that we avoid the um, the popular discourse um, out in some in the media or you know, in, in political discussions and the like, uh, that, uh, that, are, that is divorced from the actual facts of particular cases. Um, wh whether you have uh, a lot of patents or a few patents, or big money or little money, it depends on the invention that you have made and its commercial use. Uh, uh, and as patent lawyers and professors and patent administrators and the like, we need to be very focused on the actual law and the specifics. And what we need to have, make sure we have is a system of laws that is balanced and provides the appropriate economic incentives and the appropriate economic compensation. Um, so I'll leave it at that given the time, but, but you know, it's it's there can be danger both ways. If you overcompensate, you disincentivize the manufacturing and the distribution of the product. If you undercompensate, then you disincentivize the creation of the invention in the first place. Um, you need to be fair to both sides. Thanks. That's incredibly on point. And really, we always have to remind ourselves cases are about individual fact patterns and parties, and especially us in the professoriate often get tempted to say the case stands for this and spin it out into it something more abstract. Uh, and then balancing those incentives is absolutely the way we need to go. Another question then from Yard Van Ingen. How do you measure quality of patents within a standard to figure out how to distribute royalties? Can it be citation based or is there a better proxy? As this might be better for an SEP itself, but uh, Director Yonko, if you could respond to that at least a bit. Uh, I do think it's uh, better for the SEP. My, uh, my main uh, focus, as I've mentioned in the opening remarks, is just don't have us do it in, in the administration. Uh, you know, um, uh, our function in the, in the administration is to issue patents, um, uh, make sure we guide the right policy uh, provisions for the United States. Um, but then uh, I think it should be private parties, uh, the courts, um, and so on, uh, that make these determinations. This is a critically important point because not everybody agrees with us. Uh, there are various other countries um, that have been making a push to have the administration in their countries the equivalent of the USPTO, for example, in some other country, uh, make some of these determination determinations and measure a whether a particular uh, patent is within or outside of a of a standard, um, and then to go further to uh, Yard's question, uh, 
um, how valuable it is. Um, uh, I think in the United States, we're better off with the administration staying away from that, government staying away from that and let the private market uh, make these determinations. Historically, it served us very well and uh, the market generally does a good job at that. Ideally, the standard setting organization itself in its foundational documents up front can get its members together and agree to a process uh, that creates the most transparency and clarity and efficiency of markets down the line. Right. And then um, the final question that came in and we're almost out of our time, but you've touched on it a bit a few times, but the question is basically about what the US can do to continue to lead in innovation and patenting and what's China doing that helped it lead uh, leap ahead of so much of the world. I think really you've touched on this a bit, but if you have any final comments about this tech leadership again, what do we need to be doing at the PTO level? Well, what has China done? And how can we make sure we maintain our leadership? That would be great. That is such a good and broad question. Uh, thanks, uh, Joshua, for that question. Um, we can have a whole hour on, on, on this point. Um, China's doing lots of things. Um, the nice part is that they're telling us in their Made in China 2025 and 2035 plans, what's generally what they're doing. Um, uh, we don't have to guess. They are attending more and more to their IP and investment in R&D and, and, and the like. Uh, plus, uh, they are engaged in the largest um, uh, theft of, uh, of IP of any other country in the world. Uh, so it's all of that in combination uh, on their side. And in this administration, we're doing everything we can to address those issues. Well, let me focus on the US. <clears throat> um, uh, there are lots of things that we must do. We must make sure on a continuous basis that we have a stable, strong, reliable, predictable IP system that will enable um, uh, further investments uh, in innovation and uh, technological growth. But perhaps the most important thing we can do is to increase the number of people in the United States who are involved in innovation. Innovation in the United States is highly concentrated. It's concentrated demographically. So, for example, we have a study issued again by Andy Toole from the USPTO just a few months ago showing that women make up only 13% of inventors named on US patents in 2019, just last year. Uh, racial minorities, numbers are even lower, according to some other studies. Uh, it's, it's, it's also concentrated geographically. You only, you know, it's only in pockets like Silicon Valley, for example, Boston, Philadelphia corridor, things like that. Vast swaths of our geography do not, does not, do not participate at the same levels. It is critically important for us to involve everyone, uh, expand the innovation system demographically, geographically, and economically, by the way, uh, as well. Recent Harvard study shows that if we do that, Innovation in the United States could quadruple. That is the most, in my view, immediately tangible um, um, uh, ability for us to increase our technological edge. We have created a national council at the USPTO. You can go to USPTO.gov and look at our website for the our page on the website for the for NCEAI. National Council for Expanding American Innovation. Uh, we have leaders from industry, uh, major corporations, small businesses as well, academia uh, and government trying to create a national plan uh, but to, to help us create a national plan uh, to address these issues. I'll stop there. Yeah, that's just a perfect place to end. And I'll just say there are many reasons to have diversity and inclusion. Uh, but among them is this that the U.S. will operate best. We have all of our great minds from wherever they live, wherever they come from. Greatness comes from anywhere and being able to have them have access to and to be able to follow their dreams and their innovations. There's law school clinical programs on the country. The PTO has been very much supportive of that. And we thank you for that as well. But that really is, I think, where we need to go. We need everyone out there innovating, doing what they can, and then being able to act on those innovations. Well, Director Yanko, we're a little bit over time, but we want to be mindful of your time. 
It's been incredible to have you here for a full hour. I know that you're um, incredibly busy and have better things to do than to hang out with us, but we really very much appreciate this. Our participants appreciate it. Uh, we think you've given us just some great information to work from. And so let's have a virtual round of applause for the director. Sorry well, you don't uh, hear it, but, but <laughs> and, uh, we will let you go. And then to the um, participants, we're going to sign off now for our break. So you can go and get other coffee, snacks, whatever, and join us back at 1.15. Again, Director Yonko, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Sean. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.